songs here together and praise God and lift up our voices. Let's all stand. Dad, you come lead us. Let's go right along with what we're doing today. We are coming to his house. Amen. Yeah. It's on page 361.
great songs that, uh, that's been ever written. It's called How Great Thou Art. Amen. It's hard to describe how great God is, but this, this song comes pretty close. See you.
anybody has one you'd like to mention, feel free to do so. I want to keep, yes, Shirley. Oh, bless his heart. We'll keep Jerry in our prayers. I do want to thank all of you for our, your prayers for me. We're doing a lot better this week. And I appreciate Charles filling in, doing a great yes. job last week. I watched it and uh, just really enjoyed it. So thank you, Charles. Appreciate you and Linda. Who else has one? James? Wilbur, J.C. and Polly. Also my neighbor, Daniel Parker. Yes. I prayed for my sister Martha Rose. She went and on. And Shake Jones said she had no more cancer. Praise God. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Amen. That's great. That's an answer to prayer, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yes, Carol. Kim in our prayers. Uh, we pray for Kim every day. She's a sweet young lady. And pray God will touch her and heal her, and I know he can. He's a great physician. Who else has one here? Okay, then. So glad to see you back, and you all know, both been through it several times here. So we just pray that God continue to touch and heal you. To who else has one today? Autumn, you feeling better this morning, or still? I made it. I made it. Well, bless your heart. I know you've not been feeling good. We're so glad to see you. Who else? Anybody? Yes, little man. service today. Uh, Captain lost his sister. The service was yesterday, I think. Elsie Knuckles. Let's keep 
Cal and his family in prayer and Judy, also for Betty. Let's pray that God will touch uh, Betty Rogers, and uh, we don't want to forget about our other uh, wonderful people who are not able to come. Uh, Lewis and Pauline Taylor, and uh, they always watch. They leave a message and uh, pray that God will touch Lewis. He's really been battling this for a while now. And, Doing pretty good, I'll tell you. He's hanging right in there like a trooper. And so pray that God will touch Lewis and be with Pauline. And uh, Curtis and Hazel Burr. We talked to Curtis here about a week or two ago. And he's uh, hoping they'll be able to get back uh, pretty soon. So pray for them. God will touch them and be with them in a special way. All right. Yes. Uh, struggling mostly for grace. He's going to California for his family. for Nina. Get about Nina. Uh, yeah. And then Vita Ham. Let's pray for Vita. And uh, we also remember Carolyn and Mary. Mary Kirkman and Jerry. Uh, they uh, are still a lot of sickness going around. So let's just keep all of our loved ones in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Yes, Carolyn. Bob over here, he does a good job. Yeah. Actually went uh, yesterday to try and get back in the 
swing of things and try to do a little exercise. The doctor said, you need to do a little exercise. I said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, that's when you move your body a little bit and exert some energy. I said, well, uh, I do that every time I get up and walk to the refrigerator. <laughs> but anyway, I went to the gym. And uh, I like to get in a swimming pool because it helps my leg and uh, they don't have the pool up. So I thought, well, I'll try something different. Whenever I got on one of those little bicycles, it, uh, you don't you pedal, but you don't go anywhere. I don't like that too much. <laughs> Just keep pedaling. So I got on there and I hit quick start and start pedaling and cut off. And I hit quick start and start pedaling and cut off. I said, maybe this is a bad machine. I went to the one next to it and did the very same thing. And so after two tries, it came on and said, start pedaling faster. <laughs> I said, that's about as fast as I can go. <laughs> well, once I started pedaling a little faster, it started registering my, uh, all kinds of breathings on me, you know, when we do the bike. So, anyway, good to see Paul back today. Let's pray for Paul. He's had some cancer removed on his back there. And so, uh, his group's going to be praying, uh, playing for us next Sunday night. And we'll have a letter out this week for everybody. That if you want to bring a dessert, you can. He's buying all the pizzas for everybody as he normally does. And uh, we have a good time. His his group straightway and their bluegrass gospel. Boy, they really get with it. They do a great job. Play live music. I know you'll enjoy them next Sunday night. How oh, would you leave us in prayer? service tonight at 6, Wednesday night at 7, going through the book of Proverbs on the internet there, Grace Baptist Church Randleman on YouTube. Uh, so if you would like to tune in there, and then we're still trying to get our singing schedule worked out. If you'd like to sing on a regular basis, you can fill out in the chart there, and we'll get this out to everybody hopefully in the next week or two. Uh, birthdays this week, Scott Hicks. I want to say happy birthday to Scott. Sure it's good to see his mother here today. We're so glad she's back with us. How's Scott doing now? Good. Good. Praise the Lord for that. And Keith Hawkins. I'm sure Keith's right out here. Yes. Yeah, I figured he would be. And happy birthday to Keith out there. We love both of these young men. Anybody we didn't hear with a birthday? Anybody with a birthday? No? How about anniversary? Anybody with an anniversary? No anniversaries. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead then and take the offering up here uh, this morning. Let's see, Paul, can you help us this morning with the offering? And uh, Ron, could you help us this morning with the offering? Ron, he used to be on the 9 o'clock list, he and Steve, every week, so he's very familiar with it. I know Paul can handle it. He didn't bring his harmonica. I wanted him to get over and play with him. I told him, get ready to start playing that harmonica. <laughs> All right. Let's bow for prayer. Charles, would you ask the blessing of the gift tonight? Paul, we thank you again for the privilege that we have to be in the house of God. Amen. Thank you for the privilege we have to come to you in prayer. Yes. Father, we pray now for the offering, Lord, that we'd be mindful, Lord, and that we'd ever be a light in this community. Lord, help us to spend it wisely, Lord, and to further the gospel and the name yes. of Christ. Amen. Now be with those that give and those that are unable. Lord, just whatever is done here for the remainder of this service, may the Spirit of God be free. Touch every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much.
come and lead us as we sing our old Baptist theme song. Amazing grace.
God. I believe in the book of Revelation, you find exactly what you sang about. He is worthy. One day we'll all bow to his throne and we'll praise his name forever and ever. Amen. 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 I'd like you to take your Bible this morning and turn to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel today, and we're going to be looking <clears throat> at a passage you rarely hear preached or taught about, but it's one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. Uh, Jesus, Jesus fed the multitudes twice. Sometimes we get these two mixed up. Now, the first time it was uh, when he fed them, 5,000 men. And um, when you have 5,000 men, normally you're going to have around 5,000 women. <laughs> and then when you find 5,000 men and 5,000 women, normally there's going to be about 20,000 kids. <laughs> so I don't know how many were there all together. But uh, this one's a little bit different. It's Matthew 15 and verse number 29. And we know that he feeds again. This, these are the Jewish, I mean, I'm sorry, these are the Gentiles. It just kind of shows that the first feeding was the Jewish people. And we know it came unto his own, but his own received him not. But then he came for you and for me, the Gentiles. He came for everybody. And uh, so we see here in Matthew chapter number 15, Verse number 29, Jesus departed from thence, and he came nigh to the Sea of Galilee. And he went up into a mountain, and he sat down there, and great multitudes came unto him. I don't blame him for that. If I could find him, I'd go sit at his feet, wouldn't you? And having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered, and when they saw the dumb to speak, and the maimed to be whole, and the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. And Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude. I want to entitle the message today, Compassion Makes the Difference. Compassion makes the difference. That's what Jesus said. Why? Well, verse 32 said, Because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. And his disciples said to him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill such a great multitude? And Jesus said unto him, How many loaves have you? And they said, Seven and a few little fish. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and he gave thanks and he broke them and he gave unto the disciples and the disciples gave to the multitude. And they did all eat and they were all filled and they took up the broke uh, baskets. Notice this, the broken meat that was left. They filled up seven baskets full. These are different baskets than the first one. The first one was small baskets. The word in the Greek language here for basket means kind of like a big old laundry holder when you throw your clothes in a laundry holder. It's a big basket. And uh, verse 38, and they that did eat were 4,000 men beside women and children. So he sent them away and he took the ship and came into the coast of Magadha. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get into our message today. Compassion makes the difference. Father, we thank you for the compassion that you show towards us. Father, thank you for everyone that's come today in our midst and those who are looking on. And I pray that God, you would just help us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. We're weak and you're strong. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for the compassion you show to us. Help us to be a reflection and show others that compassion. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Heard about a Texas farmer and he went to Australia for vacation. And there he met an Australian farmer, and they got to talking with each other. And the Australian farmer showed off his big wheat field, and the Texan said, Well, we've got wheat fields that are at least four times this big. <laughs> They're trying to outdo each other, these two farmers. And, you know, everything's bigger in Texas, isn't it? And so they walked around the ranch a little bit, and the Australian showed off his herd of cattle. And the Texan immediately said, Well, we got longhorns that are twice as large as these cows. Well, the conversation almost died down 
And the Texan saw a herd of kangaroos hopping across the field. And he said, what are those? And the Australian looked at the farmer from Texas and said, well, don't y'all have any grasshoppers down there in Texas? <laughs> he knew how to get him, didn't he? Yeah. Heard about a little boy who's afraid of the, dark, of the dark. And one night his mother told him to go out to the back porch and bring you. Bring her the broom. And the little boy turned to mom and said, Mom, I don't want to go out there. It's dark. Anybody else afraid of the dark? I'm telling you, I, I hear a noise. I sing one now. <laughs> I'm her backup. <laughs> and so the mother said, Well, son, you don't have to fear the dark. Jesus is out there. He'll look after you and protect you. The little boy said, Mom, are you sure he's out there? <laughs> and the little boy looked at the mom and said, Sure, he's out there. He's always out there. He's everywhere all the time. So the little boy thought about it for a moment and he went out to the back door and he just cracked it open a little bit and he peered out into the darkness and he said, Jesus, if you're out there, would you please hand me the broom? <laughs> I know the feeling there. But we've come to the portion of the Word of God where Jesus repeats a similar miracle. We know that he has already fed in chapter 14 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. Now, there's some similarities here, but there are some differences here, major differences. In the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus primarily is ministering to the Jewish people. In this miracle, he is primarily ministering to the Gentiles. And so he is about 100 miles north of Jerusalem up in Decapolis. He's gone to the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And so that shows us something. Jesus loves both the Jew and the Gentile. Thank God he loves you and he loves me. Right. The first thing we see here, the healing of the multitude, is found in verse 29. So he departed from thence, and he came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee, and he went up into a mountain, and he sat there. Now, in verse, when you look at verse 29, it tells you that he is coming to the ministry, and he is looking for the people, and he sits down, and they find him. Look at verse 30. Great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame and blind and dumb and maimed and many others. And they cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. I mean, these people heard, hey, there's a great miracle worker here. He's in the area, and so they flock out to him. Look at the different categories of the sick and the afflicted. There's the lame. Who are the lame? Well, that's the those who are limping, the crippled, the halt. And uh, Jesus has healed many crippled in his ministry. And he, then there's the, not only the lame, there's the blind. They could not see. And again, he has the capacity to help someone who has never seen to see for the very first time. And then it says he healed the dumb. Notice that. Who are these? Well, they couldn't speak. They couldn't speak. And so he touched their vocal cords. He gave them the ability to articulate words again. Thank God he's a compassionate Savior. What a great miracle that would have been. But then I like this next one. It says there in verse number 30, not only to heal the lame and the blind and the dumb, but notice this word, the maimed. I don't want to underline that. The Greek language that carries the idea, those who are missing members of their body, the disabled, the injured, the mutilated, so if a person was missing an arm or missing a leg, Jesus gave him a brand new one. And what an unusual miracle this is. There's a lot of so-called miracle workers today. I've never seen one of them that claim to be able to put missing body parts back on main people. Only Jesus could do that. And if a person only had one eye, he'd give them another eye. And so he heals many people that came. Not a one is turned away. And this is a wonderful day in the life of the Savior and that of the disciples. He misses no one. He heals all of them. And that word for cast down there, it says that they came and cast them down at Jesus' feet and he healed them. The word cast down means to throw down, to prostrate before one. And so we see here that when they came, they literally were hurled down to the feet of Jesus in desperation of healing and being cured of their illnesses. They knew the right one to take their infirmities to, and that is to Jesus. Matthew 15, verse number 31 says this. 
And as much that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak and the maimed to behold and the lame to walk and the blind to see and they glorified the God of Israel. What's happening here? Hey, the Gentiles are getting a message. That's the ones who are not the Jews. Thank God. He came for everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, that's you and that's me, believeth in him would not perish. Woo! But have everlasting life. I'm glad we got a home in heaven. I'm glad our name's recorded in the Lamb's Book of Bible. I'm glad Jesus never leaves us nor forsakes us. I'm glad he takes our sins away and gives us his very own righteousness. And now when we stand in the presence of God, he won't see our sin. He'll see a perfect record of Jesus Christ. Amen. What a great transaction that is. Could you imagine? you remember the old Etch's sketch? Those little toys we used to play with, we'd gun, we'd draw it. And then if we messed up, all you had to do was turn the etch, etch a sketch over, shake it, and start over again. And you know that's the way it is with the Lord. We mess up, we get in life, and we do wrong, and we run from God. But I thank God that when we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He is the God of the second chance. Amen. He'll wipe your record clean. That's the Savior we're dealing with here. So what a great miracle this is. The Gentiles start believing, and they even glorify God. The God of Israel, not their false god, the Baals and all the other false gods that they worship. Now they are worshiping the true God of Israel. And so when these people see the mighty power of Christ displayed in physical manifestations and miracles, what do they do? They glorify God. That word glorify carries the idea to praise, to glorify, to celebrate. And thank God, friends, they honored and celebrated and praised God for His mighty power. Have you thought what God's done for you? He's been so good to you. He's given you a wonderful place to live. He's given you a wonderful uh, family or a, or a job or whatever good gift you have. It came down from heaven, the Bible said. He gives you air to breathe. He keeps the sun shining. He keeps everything moving at the right speed in the right place. I thank God for His power. They praise Him for His one wonderful, mighty power. Friends, have you honored and praised God for what He's done for you this past week? You say, well, what has He done? Hey, He fed you. He kept the sun shining. He clothed you. He put the oxygen in the air for you to breathe. He kept your heart beating. And the list could go on and on. Just praise God. Woo, glory, hallelujah. He's a good God. Yeah. He looks after you. And next, notice the problem develops. When you get on the mountaintop, don't be surprised when the problem comes. Yeah. Because that's what Satan's going to try to do. He's going to try to pull you away. He's going to try to get you discouraged. He's going to try to make you feel unworthy. I am unworthy, but thank God i got a worthy God. Yeah. And that's where my trust is. Amazing. Notice the second thing, the feeding of the multitude in verse 32. It says in verse number 32, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him, and he said, I have compassion on the multitude. They continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. As I said, this is not the same miracle that is recorded back in chapter 14. Jesus himself identifies two different feedings of the multitudes. Write this scripture down. Matthew 16, verses 9 and 10. So many people get them mixed up here. But they're completely different miracles. Matthew 16, verse 9, Jesus said, Do you not yet understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? You know how many they got? Twelve. One for every disciple. Yeah. And then verse 10, Neither the seven loaves and the 4,000. How many baskets did you take up there? Seven. So he is working through these disciples and he calls them to him. And he has done miracles all through the previous chapters. And now there's a tremendous statement here. He says that he has compassion on the multitudes. They, they have been without food and he doesn't want to send them back to their homes because they may die. They may faint. And so he has compassion. What is compassion? I'll tell you what compassion is. It's love in action. 
It's one thing to say you love somebody, but it's another thing to actually show it by what you do. Do you have compassion for those who are hurting? The word compassion in the Greek language carries the idea to feel sympathy or pity for someone, to be moved with love for them. I mean, a suffering with another, a painful sympathy. That's what he's talking about here. Compassion is a mixed passion of love and sorrow, and you have that love and that sorrow, and so what happens? You have to act and help that person if you really have compassion. You really care about lost people maybe you work with or know? Have you ever invited them to come to church? Have you ever thought about that person who knows not Christ? If they die without Jesus Christ, they will literally spend eternity in a lake of fire. Amen. Oh, it makes me cry when I think of that. Amen. I don't want to see anybody go to the lake of fire. They'll never get out. Why? Because they have never trusted the only one that all them sing about who can wash them and cleanse them. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Christ. Right. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley. Thank God He is the way and the truth and the life. Amen. No man comes to the Father but by Jesus. Amen. So if you'll trust Him, you'll go to heaven. But if you don't trust Him, there's no way you can get into heaven, not even by the best works you can do. Our very best works are like filthy rags, the Bible said, in the sight of a holy God. Friends, if you knew the bridge was out down the road and your friend was headed for that danger, wouldn't it be cruel if we failed to warn them? Don't go down there, the bridge is out. You might run off the bridge and kill yourself. We need that same compassion for those around us who are hurting and those who are lost, those who are sick, those who are in need. How about the youth? We need that compassion for our young people. We say they're the lost generation. Hey, every generation is lost when they know Jesus. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are saved to serve. We are saved to be a witness. And the mission field starts as soon as you leave the parking lot of the church, you're going into the mission field. Amen. You don't have to go on the other side of the world. Well, you, can, you can witness on the other side of the street. Yeah. Think about those who are sick or in the hospital. Could you show them compassion by visiting or sending them a card or maybe a phone call? Could you visit that nursing home? And these days are hard to do with all the restrictions, but could you maybe call or send a little note? I thank God for all the wonderful notes and cards I got this past week, the text. Makes you feel good to know somebody loves you enough to pray for you. I thank God for all your prayers. And it makes a difference for anyone who is down and sick or in a hard predicament when the brothers and sisters in Christ down to church get together and pray for that person and lift them up and let them know you love them. These dear saints of God, we think about some in our church who are not able to come. I talk about Betty Rogers and of course, Lewis and Pauline Taylor and Captain Judy Lynch, Patty Smith, I think of her, and Carla Ray and Curtis and Hazel. So many I could go on and on. They watch every week, but they're just not able to get out and go anymore. They are still a member of our church, and we don't want to forget them. We want to lift them up in prayer every day. Let them know we love them. Let them know we haven't forgotten about them. Check on them from time to time. Does it break your heart when somebody loses a loved one to Mr. Dad. I'm sure it does. There's a void that somebody needs another person with compassion to help fill. Only Christ can fill the void. But you could go sit with them at the funeral. Or you could go see them at the funeral home when the visitation is there. You don't have to say, preacher, I don't know what to say. You don't have to say much. Just be there with them. Just be there and boy, that's all the support. Really neat. And so, Compassion gets our attention off of our own needs. If we sit around and look maybe at all the problems we have, if we're not careful, we get in a pity party. And we think, oh, woe is me. Nobody's ever faced what I'm facing. I'm going through this and that. And I just can't seem to get back where I want to be or, or do this. And, I, and boy, we can go on and on and on. But when we just put that aside and trust Jesus and try to help somebody else, whoo, thank God we're back on the mountains. <laughs> Why is that? Because it gets our minds and our focus off of what we are having onto somebody else who needs a helping hand and it makes a big difference in their life. When a church has compassion and love towards those around them, that makes such a difference. 
Think about this verse. Write this one down. Jude chapter 1, verse 22. There's only one chapter there anyway. But look at Jude chapter 1, verse 22. And if some have compassion, making a difference. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. That's what makes a difference. There was a young man who walked a long distance in Chicago to go to D.L. Moody's church. And I've been there and I've visited that church. Beautiful church. Right there in the middle of Chicago. And somebody asked him one time, said, why don't you just go to one of the neighborhood churches? And the young man said, I go to Moody's church because they love a fellow over there. And you know, that's my prayer for Grace Baptist. That we'll love those that come. That we'll love those who need to hear the word. Yes. And we'd be honest many times, we just get worried about what's bothering us, and yet we've got people around us who are discouraged or sick, or they are having trouble around them. And so we need to get our eyes like Jesus did on those who need Him. How important is that to our character and who we are? Our faith in Christ lets people know that person loves me like Jesus does. Think about this. I heard about a wealthy businessman. He was down in Texas again, and he is a member of a very well-known church. And so prosperous, he had made a lot of money. He bought his wife a brand new car. He had never even driven it. But he bought it for his wife. He's a rich man. One day, the man woke up, was going to work, couldn't get his car started. So he thought, well, I'll just borrow my wife's car. So on the way to work, there in Dallas, Texas, he got in a traffic jam. And there was a car in front of him and a car in behind him and cars on both sides of him, and he couldn't go anywhere. And he was already a little steamed up because he was late for work, and his old car wouldn't start. You ever had a car like that? Yeah. <laughs> I've had a couple of them. I call them Jezebels. <laughs> I try to get them and turn them, and they say, I ain't going to start. Yeah. So I have to get something to start them up. And so this man's in that traffic jam, and all of a sudden, he gets so upset, he can't move. And so he honked his horn. And somebody else started honking their horn. And he honked it again. And the guy in front of him was honking his horn. And he was honking his horn back. Finally, he got so fed up with him, he got out of the car. He walked back up to the man in the front of him. And his blood pressure began to shoot up. And the member of this Baptist church walked up to the man in front of him. And he looked at him and he said, If you blow that horn again... One more time, I believe I'll spread your brains all over the freeway. Oh, no. Can't you see that I can't move, he said. And so the man sitting behind the wheel in front of him was a little bit dumbfounded. He said, man, what's wrong with you? Doesn't your bumper sticker say honk if you love Jesus? <laughs> Woo, watch out. Yeah. Watch out. The Baptist member fell down on his knees and said, I'm sorry. I'm ashamed of myself. Please forgive me. I do love you. And friends, the sad part about it, the damage was done, but thank God we got a forgiving God. Yeah. Jesus has compassion on the multitude. They'd gone three days and had not eaten. I can't even go three hours. <laughs> and so it's hard for me to go three hours and not eat. And there was no golden uh, corrals out there, no golden art supper clubs and K&W's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean, there's nothing out there, friends, but dirt it's out in the desert, kind of out in the wilderness. And so we have the Son of God. That's who we're dealing with. And He has power to take care of this situation. Now, He's already proved Himself by feeding 5,000. And so now He's getting ready to do it again. Why? Because of compassion. Had compassion on the people. Are we having compassion on those around us? Do we really love them? Are you hurting and wondering if anybody really cares about you and what you're going through? I can assuredly say Jesus knows where you are. And He loves you just like He loved them. And He has compassion on you, friends. And He will wash and cleanse and help you and heal that wounded heart that you may have this morning. Jesus wouldn't send them away hungry for fear they would faint. The word for faint in the Greek language means collapse. That's how bad it was. He was scared they would through exhaustion grow weak and just collapse and die out in the wilderness. And he knew they were getting weak. He knew they wouldn't make it back home. Why? Because he's God. He knows it all. 
Look down, if you will, Matthew 15, verse 33. And his disciples said to him, Whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill such a great multitude? I mean, he's already fed more than 5,000 people with five little loaves and two little fish. Here's a similar situation, yet the disciples are perplexed. <laughs> they forgot with God all things are possible. They, if he can feed 5,000, I think he can feed 4,000. Look at verse 34. And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? Seven and a few little fish. He inquires of their resources, and they inform him they've got seven loaves. They know that Jesus loves fish. <laughs> and so they have a few little fish. What, the, what are seven pieces of bread and a few little sardines compared to 4,000 people? Friends, little is much when God is in it. Amen. And you might think that you can't do whatever God's laid on your heart, but when God lays it on your heart, He equips you to do it. He'll be right there with you. Verse 35, He commanded the multitude to sit on the ground. Verse 36, He took up these seven loaves and these fish and He gave thanks and He broke them and gave to the disciples and the disciples gave to the multitude. He took the bread and the fish and he gave thanks for it. I always like to give thanks for what God blesses me with. It's a great testimony, a great witness. Hey, I didn't earn the I've heard people say, well, I don't have to thank God because, you know, I went out and earned all this money and I went to work and I said, who gave you the strength to do that? Who gave you the opportunity to work? Who gave you the air to breathe? Who kept your body going? Who kept your heart beating? You do owe it all to God. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So have faith in God. He took the bread and the fish. He gave thanks. That tells me we ought to give thanks to, to God for everything, the big and the small. I mean, if you've got a baloney sandwich, thank God for that. <laughs> That's a truck driver's state, they say. Huh? Here's the last thing we're done. The multitudes are getting ready to be filled because you have the blessings of abundance. Look at verse 37. And they did all eat, and they were all filled, and they took up the broken meat that was left, and there were seven baskets full. I mean, this great crowd ate until their heart was content, and they were filled to the gill. And I'm sure that fish was better than any fish you'd find at Liberty Hill or Mayflower or anywhere else. Why? Because it came from the hand of the Savior. Woo, I'm sure it's a wonderful time. Get the scene here, friends. Jesus looks up to heaven. He blesses the food. The disciples look. What's going to happen next? And there's the feeding of the 4,000. And these disciples are smiling. He's done it again. He's done it again. Little as much when God is in it. He can take a little shepherd boy named David and kill a big giant called Goliath with a, just a rock and a slingshot. He can take a man named Daniel and let him sleep in the lion's den and not even be harmed. He can take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and have them thrown in the fiery furnace and he'll get in there with them and protect them. That's our God. He can take a man called Noah who preaches 120 years. Only eight people were saved, but he saved Noah from the flood. God can take whatever you have, little or big. He can use it for His glory and for your good. That's why we see here in verse number 38. And they that eat were 4,000 men beside the women and the children. And they were all sent away. And He took a ship and He came into the coast of Magadala. Uh, Think about it. We've got a Savior who loves us. Yes. Think about it. We've got a Savior who knows our every need. Think about it. Before you ever pray, He knows you need it. Have you prayed to Him this week? Have you put your faith in Him? Look to God. Little as much when God is in it. Why? Because compassion is what makes the difference. Let's go out with that compassion this week and show compassion to somebody. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe this morning you'd say, Preacher, I've never been saved. I'm not even sure I'm going to heaven. But if that's the case, I just want to say you can be saved today. You can know the Lord. He loved you so much he died, was buried, and rose again. And maybe you'd like to invite him into your life. If that be the case, would you in your heart pray something like this? Dear Jesus, I receive you as my Savior this morning. Forgive me of my sin. Save my soul. Lord, make me a home in heaven. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And if you make that decision... I want to say you made the best decision you could ever make. And I just want to pray for you today. If you ask Christ to 
be your Savior. Would you just look up, and I know by you looking up, you made that decision. I'll pray for you today. Anyone, anywhere, preacher, pray for me. I ask Jesus to be my Savior today. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Maybe today you'd say, I know the Lord, and I'm so glad I'm saved. I thank God for His compassion and pray for me that I'll have that same compassion as I go out to try to help those around me that Jesus had with me. Pray for me, preacher. I've got a need or a bird. I'll be glad. You know, like that, you'd slip my hand up all around the sanctuary. Many hands are lifted. Father, we thank you for the compassion you show us. We thank you, Lord, for the love that you have for us. Bless each one that raised their hand. Those for salvation, let them know they've made the best decision they could ever make. And I pray for those who have been saved and we need to have that compassion, that fire reignited, that we would go out and show the love of Christ to those that we meet. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand our feet and heads about and eyes are closed. Charles will come and play softly if you like to come around the altar this morning. You come. Maybe you want to come and just ask God to help you with a need, a burden. Maybe you want to come if you've been saved and make that public. That's called making a public profession of your faith. We'll be glad to announce the good news. You come. If you want to join here, you come. Grace. Whatever the Lord leads you to do. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Christians are praying. Do you really have that compassion? Are you showing others that love of Christ? Oh, He's here to help. Maybe you're just going through a valley. Maybe you're just going through a tough time. You come today. He'll be there to help you. Amen. Anybody else? Earnestly, tender, Jesus is calling. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Charles. If you're glad you have a compassionate Savior, let's give him another big amen together. Ready? Amen. amen. Thank God. He is a wonderful God. Let's be dismissed in prayer at this time. Joe in the back, if you would, you dismiss us. Don't forget the Sunday school classes. We'll let that Joe after the service today. And uh, tell somebody you love them. Boy, there's the first step of compassion. And uh, Brother Joe, if you would, you dismiss us. Good to see you. Good to see you. How are you doing, Paul? Hanging in there.